thanks for everybody uh, for attending. Um, and we were joking uh, kind of before the uh, at the beginning of of the call here uh, when um, uh, Ben Messelman reached out to me last year about uh, presenting. We had kind of a lot of back and forth um, because I told him that. Uh, a, I was not an environmental scholar, uh, and in fact, I hadn't really done a whole lot of work, uh, made really any any work at all in this area. Uh, and B, uh, the title of the paper that that I think Ben had noticed, and that's why he had reached out to me, uh, which is called the Power View of Corporate Compliance, uh, wasn't really about power in the traditional sense at all. Uh, and in fact, uh, it was really about kind of ethical influence in organizations. And so maybe I wasn't the best choice as a speaker uh, for this audience, but. Uh, after a lot of good conversations uh, and, and some emails back and forth, um, we thought that this might work out uh, and be interesting to all of you. So uh, I, I guess we'll see. We'll have, we'll have to see how things go. And, and I'll, I'm either going to be the, the the last sort of outsider that's uh, invited here, or this is going to be a, a good start uh, to the new year, uh, which we all could probably use. So, um, so with uh, with that, um, be, because my scholarship maybe doesn't uh, align traditionally with with what some of uh, some of the other presenters uh, have have talked about, I thought I would give you a little bit of background, a little bit more background about how I come to the issue of compliance, uh, and this is going to inform kind of the broader topic of today, which is uh, unethical decision making in organizations and the risk that that it creates, and then how compliance. You know, can and should be uh, considering uh, that risk. Okay, so uh, prior to uh, me beginning my academic career, uh, I practiced law for uh, for about a decade. Uh, this is, uh, if you look to the to the lower corner there, you'll see a uh, clean shaven, uh, fresh faced young lawyer, uh, less wrinkles, more hair. Okay, that's me. Um, and so I did all all my work uh, as a practicing attorney. Uh, um, for about a decade in Chicago, and I practiced almost exclusively white collar criminal defense uh, in, in and around the Chicago area. And so if you know anything about uh, Chicago or Chicago politics, uh, you know there is plenty of white collar crime uh, to go around. Uh, and so there's a lot of work for uh, criminal defense attorneys. Um, so for example, uh, you may recognize, some of you may recognize this person, uh, this is George Ryan, uh, was involved in George Ryan's case. Uh, he was one of Illinois' former governors, uh, one of six uh, total, uh, who was in, indicted for uh, crimes uh, while he was governor, six and a half years in prison. Uh, another um, uh, Illinois governor, this is maybe a face you probably recognize a little bit more. Uh, this, of course, is Rod Blagojevich, uh, who was also indicted as an Illinois governor, who famously um, auctioned off uh, um, what was what was then uh, Barack Obama's uh, Senate seat uh, and was convicted, um, charged with the crime and convicted, spent, um, charged, uh, sorry, uh, sentenced to 14 years in prison, uh, whose sentence was recently um, commuted by uh, President Trump. Uh, and so I've had the opportunity to represent lots of, uh, you know, politicians, business people in white collar and corporate crime matters, uh, every, everybody essentially from CEOs kind of down to secretaries. Um, but the client that was the most important to my career, I think, um, oh yeah, sorry, here's uh, just one more kind of rogues gallery picture there. I won't keep that one up for too, too much longer. There's uh, some of our Illinois governors. Uh, but this was the guy that actually had the biggest impact uh, on my career, if you will. Um, and his name is Terry. Uh, certainly not as high profile as some of the other uh, clients that I had. Uh, but the reason that he was so important to me was, it's fairly simple. So he was probably the most like me uh, when, when I represented him. So when Terry came into my office, uh, he was in his late 30s. Uh, he was married, uh, you know, had a, had a great family life, had a child, one child, planning to have another. Uh, Terry was really well educated, um, on a good school. He had a successful career. He was an accountant and a consultant, uh, came from a good family. Uh, in fact, his mother was, uh, the president of a bank uh, where Terry had a connection, uh, which will become important in a second. Uh, and his sister was also uh, there at that bank, sort of a community bank where she was a COO. Um, but despite all this, uh, you know, if you were across from me uh, at a desk, that's really not a, a place that you want to be because that means that you're entangled in the criminal justice system in, in some way or another. And so Terry ended up pleading guilty to one count of bank fraud. And 
uh, what he had done is essentially he had allowed a friend uh, to use a bank account that he controlled. Um, and the friend was a high stakes gambler uh, in and around the casinos uh, in Hammond, Indiana, which is just over the, uh, the border uh, from Illinois. And he got in uh, way over his head, uh, as gamblers uh, tend to do. And he started kiting checks, which is falsifying checks. Um, and so Terry allowed him to use a bank account essentially in order to do that. Uh, and what it caused was uh, the bank itself actually to go under, to go into receivership. Um, and then that resulted in an investigation which um, ensnared uh, Terry. Uh, it also uh, caused his mother uh, to, to lose her job as a president of the bank uh, and his sister also to be charged uh, criminally. And so, you know, as a young attorney who was representing someone like this, uh, I could never understand sort of how this happened, right? Uh, like many of the clients that I saw, um, and like many, of, many, many people uh, that are involved in, in wrongdoing in organizations, Terry was, for all intents and purposes, a really good person, right? He knew right from wrong. Uh, he, you know, he came from a good family, had a good education. Uh, he, he didn't need the money, right? He didn't even gain really anything uh, from, from this fraud, uh, and yet he did it anyways uh, and, and caused himself and his family uh, to lose so much, uh, including having a felony uh, on his record. And so the question for me became why, right? Why is it that someone like this would engage in an ethical act, a criminal act that would cost them so much? And if you want to generalize this question a little bit, um, it's kind of a bigger one, which is why is it that good people sometimes uh, do bad things? And this kind of became the motivating question for me, I think, as I trans, uh, transitioned into academia. And so for those of us that are interested in compliance, uh, I would submit that it has to be a motivating question for you too. So maybe it's not gonna be the motivating question of your career, but if you really want to understand compliance and do compliance better, I think it's gotta be something that's uh, front of mind for you as well. Uh, and the reason for that is because we are all Terry to some extent, okay? So compliance is often talked about in, in terms of good versus bad or, or right versus wrong. If you're talking about criminality, it's often in terms of sort of evil versus good. Uh, but the reality is that, you know, all the people in your organization, uh, all the people that you work with day to day, uh, all the people on this call, right? All of us, we are good people, uh, most likely, uh, but we are also capable of doing the bad thing under certain circumstances. Uh, and we know this because the past 20 years or so, uh, behavioral ethics research uh, essentially tells, tells us this. So the strongest finding from that research is that people simultaneously think of themselves as good people yet they frequently lie or cheat, uh, typically in a minor way. And so essentially all the research is showing uh, that we lie and cheat much more often than we care to admit, while at the same time striving to maintain uh, a positive image of ourselves uh, and of our morality. Ca call this this idea of uh, self-concept maintenance. And this comes from Francesca Gino and many others. Dan Ariely at Duke has been a leader in, in this area as well. Um, if we want to um, you know, generalize this and put this under the larger behavioral ethics umbrella, um, I think a series of studies, uh, all the research essentially uh, under this subfield shows us that cognitive heuristics, uh, the psychological tendencies, uh, pressures in organizations and social pressures um, can often make even these sort of irre uh, irrelevant uh, factors or seemingly irrelevant factors uh, can make it more likely, uh, sorry, that we're going to, that good people will do uh, bad things. And this comes from uh, Robert Prentice, you know, a mentor of mine uh, at the McCombs School uh, in Texas. And so uh, much of my work is focused on understanding you know, how these influences uh, impact uh, behavior and how they lead to either unethicality or wrongdoing. And then, of course, then once we understand that, how can we think about organizations using their compliance apparatus, so the compliance function, to guard against it, and then hopefully foster ethical decision-making and law-following uh, behavior uh, on a more proactive uh, level. Um, and that would include, of course, making decisions about following, say, environmental regulations, 
and a host of other, um, you know, white collar and corporate crimes or quasi uh, crimes if we're thinking about kind of the interplay between civil and criminal law. Uh, so if I had to sum up uh, my worldview on ethical decision making and compliance and, and risk, it would probably look something like this, um, which you don't have to get caught up too much on the on the, the definitions there, but it's really the idea that everything sort of starts from the ethical decision making process of the individual in an organization, which of course is influenced by that organization itself, and then things kind of flow out uh, from there. All right, so this brings me uh, to the current paper and, and I guess the focus of, of today. Um, and so maybe it's not surprising, uh, given my background and my worldview, uh, that I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Department of Justice here uh, for a second to, to set things up a bit. Uh, so as, as some of you may be aware, uh, the Department of Justice recently issued a, a new guidance document to all of its prosecutors uh, in the, in the um, fraud division uh, or sorry, rather, in the criminal division uh, regarding corporate compliance programs. Uh, and so this was titled the evolution, uh, or sorry, the evaluation of corporate compliance programs. Um, and this is basically an updated or kind of a more formally constructed version of a set of questions that um, the DOJ Compliance Council, and her name is Wei Chen, uh, drafted in 2007. Um, and the purpose of this new guidance is to assist prosecutors, oh, sorry, and, and then this has been uh, tweaked a little bit in June 2020, but essentially it's the same thing. So you may see uh, slightly different dates. Uh, but the purpose of the guidance is to assist prosecutors in making informed decisions as to whether uh, a compliance program was effective at the time of the offense, okay? And, and that's for, wit, for the company uh, that's being investigated at the time. Um, in order to do that, uh, the guidance is organized around roughly 100 questions that prosecutors are going to consider uh, when they're when they're reviewing a company's program. Um, now, it's important to note, you know, the the evaluation of corporate compliance um, guidance is really a document for organizations that are already in trouble, right? So the reason the prosecutor is going to evaluate the company's program is because there's some some sort of offense has occurred that the corporation uh, could have liability for. Um, but we also know that the realities of the compliance field itself is that this type of guidance, just like almost any other Department of Justice guidance or many of other of our regulatory organizations out there that are gonna comment on compliance, that guidance is gonna be disseminated uh, out. It's gonna be grasped onto by law firms, compliance providers, uh, uh, you know, compliance teams in organizations and companies. Uh, so it's really important to understand what's in this, because just like the organizational sentencing guidelines, which which all of this is is based upon, these guidelines are going to have a large influence on the practices of compliance uh, as a whole. Okay, so so what's in it? Uh, well, there's a lot uh, in here, uh, that's for sure. So it's now about this guidance is about 20 pages long. Uh, it makes frequent references to the U.S. Attorney's Manual and other principles of the Federal Prosecutions of Business Organizations, which is uh, another guidance document. Um, and, you know, those are dozens of pages themselves. Um, and so there's a lot in here, but it's basically organized around three main questions. Uh, is a compliance program well designed? Is the program going to be applied in good faith? Essentially, how effective uh, is the implementation? And then does the program work uh, in practice? And so while all this is a sensible way uh, in you know, my estimation to consider compliance, uh, and I was particularly heartened to see things like risk assessment, uh, which comes up a lot in this guidance document, take a prominent role, I am still not sure that the new guidance is going to do uh, as much for improving the legal and regulatory conformity uh, in organizations as this document is intended. And again, because this is disseminated out so much, um, you know, what regulators think is likely to happen based on these types of documents. Um, and the reason for that is, I don't think the document is gonna change a lot of the underlying assumptions on which compliance programs are based, uh, especially when it comes to compliance failures, which this document is ostensibly aimed at. Uh, and that's because, uh, most companies believe uh, 
or at least they act as if they believe, if they haven't explicitly stated, that compliance failures occur according to a standard distribution that is typified by kind of a typical or an average violation in their organization. Uh, and so in my view, the vast majority of our compliance tools, uh, education, monitoring, enforcement, are all sort of aimed at preventing uh, this typical lapse, if you will, right? Elapses that are sprinkled throughout the, uh, throughout the company or throughout the organization. And those compliance programs are aimed at mitigating the typical level of harm that flows from that type of, of lapse. And this assumption is implicit in how compliance programs are, are conceived and how they, how they operate. But it's also perpetrated by regulators. Uh, who credit, give broad credit uh, to um, compliance programs that are consistently applied and are applied across the organization kind of no matter what. Uh, that's the underlying message of things like the organizational sentencing guidelines and like this new guidance document that's gonna, that's gonna uh, cover all, all organizations. Um, and the problem is that unethical acts in business which is similar to unethical um, acts in other domains and criminal behavior more generally, they often follow a much different model. So they follow a fat-tailed or a power law distribution model where volatility is actually the norm. So both as to the frequency of the lapses of compliance lapses themselves, but also as to the intensity of the harms that are often caused by interrelated lapses or interrelated unethical decision making. Um, and so uh, this uh, power law distribution that I want to talk about in a little bit is a product of how all these individual ethical decision making, how it interacts with the social and organizational networks within an organization or a company. And so what that means is that that companies or organizations are often focusing, I think, too much on kind of the masses within the organization, that they're trying to blanket their companies uh, with uh, compliance tools in order to try to stop this typical lapse and not focusing enough on what I would call the, the power few. So that's where I get this notion of power in, in the title. Um, they should be thinking about those within the organization that have the ability based on their connections to foster extreme and this interrelated compliance risk that is really har harmful for companies, employees, and ultimately uh, society more broadly. Okay, uh, so uh, let me uh, explain a little bit more uh, on the theory that I'm gonna base my argument on, and then I'm gonna touch, I'm gonna come back to the practical side uh, and, and make sure we talk about uh, specific things that compliance programs might wanna think about as they're, as they're going forward. Okay, so uh, much of the paper um, and, and the thesis uh, on which is based can be summed up actually with just a couple uh, images. And so uh, this would be, there we go. Um, there we go, this would be the first one. Uh, and so it shows uh, a normal distribution and a fat tail distribution, uh, or in this case, uh, a power law distribution. So a normal distribution uh, on the left is the standard bell curve uh, that we all know very well. And so what it's showing is that there's a large number of events uh, that cluster around a mean or an average. And that extreme events tend to fade, a bit, fade away very quickly as you move away from that mean, right? So the frequency basically drops to zero or very close to it as you get away from that, that average. So this distribution is, you know, you're familiar with it because it's ubiquitous in the natural sciences. Uh, sciences. So uh, the, the best example I have of this, uh, the one that resonates the most with me, is human height. Uh, so many of us uh, cluster around the average, right, as to our height. Uh, so for example, for men, it's about five foot nine. Um, yes, there are some very short people out there, and yes, there are some very tall people, uh, but the tails of that distribution drop off really quickly once you get a standard deviation or two away from, uh, from that mean or that average. So some 90% of the population is gonna fall within two standard deviations of that mean. Um, and so this type of normal distribution is really helpful in understanding a population that you're studying. Uh, it can help you make very accurate predictions as to the next event, right? So 
Um, if you know that a universe follows a normal distribution, uh, and say we're looking at height again, if you're walking down the street, you can essentially predict with very close accuracy the height of the next person uh, that you're likely to come in contact with. So most of the people that you're going to see are going to be a few inches within a few inches of that average. Yes, you can encounter, you know, uh, an NBA center that's seven foot one, uh, but you're never going to come across a 20 foot tall person, right? It just is is extremely unlikely, and impossible if we're following this kind of normal distribution. All right. That though is not the case if we're talking about a fat tail distribution, because in that situation, we're, we've lost sort of this notion of a stable average, if you will. And instead, volatility is really what we should be expecting. So extreme events, uh, the ones falling at the end of the tail are to be expected, and there's really no meaningful average uh, to speak of. And that's because the tails here go uh, to zero much, much more slowly. And so that's what's shown on the right here. So any new event that's encountered, if it happens to fall at the extreme, can just completely shift uh, the average. And so in turn, it's really difficult to make those probability estimates that I talked about uh, before, because the next person that you encounter not only could be 20 feet tall, they might be 5,000 feet tall, all right? And that would completely shift kind of how you look at this universe or how you look at the average. And so it wouldn't be unexpected at all um, in, in a in a universe that's height uh, followed this type of power law distribution to have, uh, you know, a, a 5,000 foot person uh, walking down the street. Now, based on that, you might think power law distributions uh, have to be rare because of this inherent volatility. So that's actually not the case. So we see power laws in all kinds of different populations especially ones that have a social component. And I'm gonna come back to that uh, in, in a second. Uh, but just to give you uh, some examples, uh, we see power law and fat tail distributions and things like city size, right? Uh, you have uh, lots of cities that are very, very small, small town. You have some that are kind of medium sized, you know, sort of medium sized city. But then you also have these absolutely massive mega cities that just keep growing and growing and growing, right? That are so uh, so much larger than anything else out there. They completely skew uh, the average. You think about some place like, um, you know, like Tokyo, or you know, even maybe like New York, for example. And there really don't seem to be any any stopping uh, the size. Uh, another example: the structure of the internet. Of course, you have the vast vast majority of uh, websites out there have almost no traffic, right? Uh, a, you know, a very, very low traffic. And then you have some that are absolutely massive that are essentially like the heart of the internet. You can think about something like Google, for example, or maybe Facebook or, or Wikipedia. Um, something a little bit more closer to home, income distribution also fo follows a power law distribution, right? Where you have this group at the top that controls a massive amount of, of income. And notably, you also see this type of distribution in prime data. It is incredibly pervasive. Uh, so we see it in studies of, say, crime location, uh, where a few street addresses experience the vast majority of, of crimes in a city, and some will uh, see almost no crime. A, a small percentage of city blocks, for example, consume a massive amount of resources related to uh, incarcerating, incarcerating city residents, uh, and a small proportion of places experience a very large proportion of particular types of crimes uh, as well. We also see this in uh, offender and victim uh, stats. So research would show that a uh, few offenders commit the most amount of crime and reap, uh, reap the most illegal gain. Uh, this is true across populations. So everyone from a juvenile delinquents to mobsters to uh, crooked uh, police officers, studies have shown follow this type of of power uh, law distribution. Um, relatedly, a small percentage of crime victims also account for a large percentage of our total victimization. So uh, in fact, most crime related data appears to follow uh, some type of power law distribution, some stronger than others. And that of course would include white collar uh, crime and corporate crime. Uh, now I'm gonna show you this. this, is a little bit of a joke. This is something called the white collar crime heat map. Uh, that was started on kind of a lark, but um, but of course, because most of the crime is centered around uh, New York and, and Washington, D.C. Uh, 
uh, and which is sort of you know generally funny when you think about white collar crime. Um, but I actually think it does kind of uh, make the point uh, that we want to be thinking about connections between people and um, and um, situations where there's a social component uh, because that can affect uh, these distributions. And so um, when we look at social aspects of how unethical or illegal behavior operates in organizations, the same type of thing uh, can happen. So there's a large body of, of research coming out of the behavioral ethics space that I mentioned uh, earlier on, suggesting that unethical behavior is influenced by these social and organizational ties. Essentially, we lie and cheat uh, more when we feel psychologically close to others that are lying and cheating. This brings us back to the work uh, Francesca Gino, uh, which we saw at the outside. Um, so the social component, right, the social connections appears to break down some of these cognitive barriers that we have to acting un unethically. Uh, and this is consistent, of course, with how criminologists view the causes and, um, and uh, perpetuation of white collar and occupational crime. So uh, criminologists would think about things such as differential association, which was a theory uh, that was advanced by Edwin Sutherland, called the godfather of white collar crime, the person who coined the phrase and kind of came up with the concept, as well as this idea of rationalization, which comes from a student of Donald Cressy, I'm sorry, student of Edwin Sutherland named Donald Cressy, who took this idea of differential association, crime as a learned behavior, and looked at what are the mechanisms by which people actually go forward with committing a white collar crime. Part of that story is the rationalization, how you can essentially justify in your head that you're two things at the same time. You're a good person, right, while also doing the unethical, unethical thing. And what Cressy found is uh, the way that you verbalize what you're doing to yourself or what you're doing, right, how you see that relationship can actually create a rationalization that lets that, uh, that, lets that bad conduct go, go forward. And so these social and organizational ties seem to allow that type of rationalization to go forward. Okay, so if it's true that individuals are uh, that are joined by some kind of psychological closeness are maybe more prone to commit, uh, to commit violations of laws or norms uh, when others around them are doing so, um, when those individuals are then linked in a network, the number and harm of those violations has to increase. And so this leads to that power law dynamic that I was talking about where essentially you have kind of nodes of unethical behavior that tend to grow larger and larger, which ultimately lead to this outsized harm or these outsized events, right? So outsized harm and, and at times extreme harm uh, within organization caused by unethical decision-making. Um, and this very thing has been suggested and then modeled mathematically by network theorists themselves, uh, particularly those uh, who are studying um, a rioting behavior, which is kind of an interesting uh, way to look at this problem. But uh, there is a network uh, theorist and scientist called Mark Granabetter who found that the individual thresholds for joining a riot were reduced, right? This idea of rationalization. You can come up with ways to allow yourself to join the riot when the rioters knew each other. So essentially what it did was he looked at the way rioting behavior instead of kind of building gradually like we might expect, right? One or two people committing bad behavior and that sort of slowly and slowly building, he saw it kind of flash all at once. And he was trying to understand why is that? Why does, why does writing behavior kind of jump up out of almost nowhere? Okay, of course, this type of thing is particularly apropos uh, uh, these days. Um, and what he found is that group behavior isn't determined just by the average makeup but rather by kind of the details of the various ethical thresholds that all these members have and how they're linked together. Um, and also he found that this bad collective behavior didn't follow this normal distribution, right? It didn't build in this predictable way. Instead, it flashed at seemingly an arbitrary point, but what he found was that really it was because of the relationship between the people that are sort of engaged in kind of the writing behavior and those that are observing it. And if they had a personal connection, right, they had some kind of connection on a social or organizational uh, standpoint, it allowed those individual thresholds to bad behavior uh, to be lowered and then everyone to kind of join uh, all at once. All right, 
so that's sort of the theoretical uh, uh, background. Um, and so the question then, of course, is what does all this mean uh, for, for corporate compliance? Uh, I think it can mean a number of things. Uh, so one is that maybe looking at uh, at this at compliance from a slightly different uh, uh, way here can help exp explain how some of these extreme compliance events um, can occur in companies, even companies that have long-standing kind of seemingly robust compliance programs. I mean, remember, we're we're talking. You know, we have a you know I've looked at a 60 year history of compliance, um, you know, kind of in the modern era, but, but even taking that aside, I mean, we're talking about decades of, of guidance on compliance, organizational sentencing, you know, guidelines in the, in the 90s, uh, up until now, we are fairly sophisticated in most companies about what compliance uh, should be and all the, all the tools of compliance. Yet we seem to get a lot of extreme compliance failures even uh, even knowing that. Um, an example of that um, uh, that I saw is, is Wells Fargo. So uh, most people have pilloried Wells Fargo and rightfully so um, for what happened. You know, if you're not familiar, of course, Wells Fargo, uh, 5,200 employees were found to engage in um, a, a legal or, or unethical behavior. They were creating false customer accounts. Um, and then this led to one of the largest uh, fines against the bank uh, in U.S. history, in fact, uh, even um, uh, Wells Fargo having to get approval in order to expand sort of an unheard of type of thing uh, in the banking industry. Um, and so what looked like this terrible, you know, compliance failure of corporate culture and all that um, actually turns out to be much more of a power law story in, in, in my estimation. So what, what we saw was uh, the very quick spread of bad behavior that emanated from a few highly influ influential people. So, you know, the unethical hubs, if you will, in this organizational network. Because if you look closely at what happened in, in the Wells Fargo case, that company had a very robust, for most, um, on, on most uh, metrics, a very robust compliance program. Uh, it was sophisticated at all kinds of training, even training specific as to um, false customer accounts. Um, and, and so it was sort of a question about why did this happen? Add to that the fact that creating false customer accounts is actually not at all in the interest of the organization, right? Usually we think about white collar crime as something that benefits uh, the company, and therefore that's why they would allow it uh, to go forward. It didn't really benefit the company at all. Uh, when your employees create fake accounts that you can't actually monetize, it's not a good thing. All it does essentially is, is waste employee uh, time and, and causes you to pay them more in, in bo bonuses for things that aren't accurate. So the question is, how did this happen and why did this happen? If you look really closely, what you see is an influential group of, um, of managers who kind of move throughout the organization. And as they move, uh, this unethicality follows along with them. And so you can sort of map the network, if you will, and see how, uh, and see how that spread. Um, another example of this is uh, Goldman Sachs in a recent um, a scandal related to um, a Malaysian uh, investment fund. Uh, so they, Goldman Sachs was um, asked to raise money uh, for bond sales by the state-owned fund. It's supposed to pr promote economic development. Uh, massive FCPA violation leads to almost a $3 billion penalty. Um, uh, and that seems to be another instance where you had a company with a very robust, uh, well thought out, well designed, if you will, a compliance program, but where some highly influential group of people created an extreme amount of, of conduct risk um, uh, and, and it sort of spread uh, through the organization or at least in this pocket of, of the organization. Uh, and so maybe this idea explains partially uh, why we keep seeing these kind of dramatic compliance uh, failures, even in mature programs. Uh, secondly, and, and more importantly, um, I think the paper, uh, what I'm hoping the paper does, is it challenges some of the assumptions that compliance programs have been operating under. Um, that, you know, that there's some average compliance laps out there uh, that we can solve by blanketing organizations with compliance tools, right? What I would call kind of the compliance shotgun. Right. Let's just send everything at all employees at all times and hope for the best because we're really trying to tamp down kind of a typical violation or a typical level of harm 
as opposed to let's be more uh, focused um, and think more about uh, behavioral risk. Um, the other thing uh, that the other assumption here is that we can train our way out of, out of compliance lapses by these kind of scheduled online training that's really divorced from actual conduct. So the vast majority of companies that, that I interact with, when you ask them what their compliance program is, you realize it's very much on a set schedule and it happens almost rote and in lockstep. Now again, they're following the dictates of organizational sentencing guidelines and other, um, other guidance, um, and particularly because regulators are telling them that's what's important, that's what they should do, but in my estimation, that isn't really a behaviorally cognizant uh, strategy. Uh, and so hopefully what we can do is think a little bit more about behavioral risk and the power few or the influential uh, folks in organizations that have the ability to influence ethicality, uh, not only of themselves, but maybe even the entire organization and then the harm that's caused from their unethical behavior. Uh, and so if we can take this more behavioral uh, risk-oriented approach, I think there are a number of practical avenues that we can go down. So part of this is kind of um, recalibrating our assumptions about where compliance risk and compliance failures come from. And then thinking about, okay, now that we've got a little bit um, a more risk focused or behavioral risk focused idea, what can we do um, practically to try to uh, take advantage of that? So first I would identify um, who in an organization possesses heightened ethical risk, okay? And so we can think about two earlier concepts um, this inside out approach that starts with uh, individual ethical decision making, and then the idea of these individual thresholds to unethical behavior. Take that kind of as our starting point. Um, we can then consider which of our employees might be more likely to engage in unethicality, right? Which of our employees' ethical thresholds might be uh, impacted or might uh, be lowered uh, uh, more so than we want to, or at least in a way that would create. Uh, ethical risk. And so there's a number of diagnostics out there um, that would uh, partially get to this. Um, so uh, things like, um, you know, the Mach 4 test and uh, other ethical decision making uh, uh, diagnostics. Um, my problem with many of those is they're often too general. So they're focused on kind of ethical decision making generally and not in the context of specific organizations and what those organizations rules and values are and whether employees actually understand them and then their personal values align with the organizational values. Uh, and so what I'm doing now in a project with, uh, with one of my colleagues here at Kelly is working on a behavioral ethics risk scale that would hopefully allow for a more accurate understanding of individual ethical decision-making risk. And so this would be an idea, uh, you know, a scale or survey that we could give to employees and it helps uh, the companies identify who might pose just by the way that they sort of understand um, ethical decision making in the context of their own company, how that might uh, create uh, increased risk. If so, Todd, that, let me. Uh, oh, sorry. Sure. No, uh, so, we have a question from Paul Ferraro, uh, which is of a practical matter. So he yeah. wants to know how would people in the environmental field determine if non-compliance in their context follows a power law distribution and whether social connections are an important moderator of non-compliance? What kind yeah, of data good. and analysis would be necessary? Yeah, that's a great question. It's actually sort of what I'm what I'm want to get to uh, or coming to just right now. So it's good timing. Um, so the the way that I would think about this is. Um, who in your organization uh, can create risk by uh, virtue of their own decision making and the connections that they have? So one way to, to look at that or think about that is what do what connections do people have in their in your organization? So most most folks from a client standpoint would look at uh, the organizational chart, right? And they would think about compliance primarily from an organizational standpoint. The person that creates the greatest ethical risk is gonna be the CEO or the CFO or whatever in some organizational, organizational hierarchy. That I don't think is necessarily the case. So what you can actually do is you can find out who in your organization has, is essentially uh, the most central or well-connected, right? And you can do that by asking individuals who their friends are or who their 
you know, who they're the cl most connected to. And if you do that, what you find out is that there's something called the friendship paradox uh, in network theory that basically says uh, when we nominate who our friends are, they are more likely to have more friends than we have, right? It's just sort of they're closer to the center of the network um, because on average they have they have sort of uh, they have more friends than we do, and so they're more centrally connected, which means they have more influence if we're talking about uh, behavior or ideas, okay? And so once we figure out who those people are, we can actually maybe monitor those folks. And so if we see that our sort of friends of friends are engaged in uh, wrongdoing or unethicality, we can expect that that would move throughout the organization uh, um, more broadly. And so that is actually a way to either use data or use network theory in order to identify where wrongdoing is and where it's more likely to go. Um, and, and I'll say that's a pretty, um, you know, from compliance folks, that's kind of like the holy grail, if you will, because we're always trying to figure out on a, on a, on a predictive way where wrongdoing is, is headed. Um, as to the question of, you know, whether power law is, is operating, um, you know, in some ways, I think that you can pick it up through traditional compliance metrics if you're looking in the right place. So uh, one strategy is to do, you know, sort of a traditional audit, right? Uh, that's a compliance tool that, that many companies will do. Uh, pick an area where there's a rule or a law and audit whether there's compliance in that space. That usually, though, is where companies stop. So they find the wrong, and then they address that wrong with the individual. Um, if they go farther, they might try to do some kind of root cause analysis, but they almost never ask the question of, okay, who else, are, who else was involved, but then also who are they connected to, unrelated to the actual wrongdoing itself. That's a way to be thinking about, all right, how is this individual instance that creates a small kind of typical amount of risk, how is that maybe going forward and, and expanding to create some outsized type of risk? And if you can do that, I think you will be able to identify whether there actually is this um, extreme compliance risk kind of brewing in your organization or whether it's truly kind of a one-off that we can manage with traditional assumptions and traditional uh, compliance tools. Um, okay, uh, let's see, uh, since we're getting sort of close here. Um, oh, I mean, so, I, and I'll, maybe this is a kind of a good place to, to wrap up and thinking about practical um, uh, implications. I think all of this highlights uh, the need uh, for more data uh, in, in compliance. So most organizations have a really good idea of, of um, you know, they focus their data collection efforts uh, outward facing. So. How is our consumers, you know, how are they impacted? You know, lots of data related to them, uh, lots of understanding of kind of user experience type things. Uh, they very rarely turn it uh, in a real way inward into their own employees. And so uh, I think we need to do that if we're actually going to identify some of these assumptions on which compliance is based and, and test whether they're actually accurate or not, uh, to, to Paul's point. Um, so instead, I would like to see companies, even sophisticated companies that are really good at data collection, uh, what they often don't do is look inward. And so uh, I think this is just part of the paper is a little bit of a call for, for more data collection uh, in, in this area. Um, I mean, maybe so a good, we have, good, yeah, good place to spot. okay, yeah. sorry. We have a further clarifying question. So uh, Catherine Doss wants to know that, should we assume that when you say organizations, you're including public organizations, uh, for example, government or quasi-governmental organizations? Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I tend to talk in the terms of uh, business uh, and, and corporations, but I don't think there's any reason that this doesn't apply in any large organization, uh, for, for example. I mean, uh, anytime that you have people connected uh, by social or organizational ties, you have uh, the opportunity for unethical decision-making uh, to, to spread and be influenced by those, those around you. Yes, it could be, you know, someone your, your supervisor tells you to do 
the unethical or illegal thing, but oftentimes it's more of this threshold lowering. This is the kind of idea of sort of good people doing bad things, right? These situational factors that impact uh, your decision making oftentimes without you necessarily knowing it. So yeah, I would, um, you know, uh, whether you're talking about a nonprofit or a for-profit company, I think this is all in play. Now the organizational, you know, the other factors, the additional factors certainly would impact that as well. If you have a really strong mission and, um, you know, in a nonprofit that maybe that would mitigate some of this as opposed to sort of a profit driven mission in an organization, but uh, I think it's going to apply to all. So we have another question from Paul Ferraro, uh, who's asking from a social welfare perspective, it sounds like you're assuming that a large a typical non-compliance event committed by a small, small number of people are more ham harmful than small typical non-compliance events committed by millions of people. Am I correct that this assumption underlines your argument? Yeah, um, so, so I, I think that's a good, I mean, it's a fair, Question, it's a good point. I mean, you could think about, I mean, yes, you can think about harm lots of different ways. I, I guess what I'm, and, and so you could have um, individuals commit a certain type of uh, individual harm uh, that, you know, that has a big impact. So for example, you, you know, uh, a safety violation where someone is killed, for example, that could be, you know, a, a single individual commits that. It's kind of a typical uh, type of thing. I guess what I'm, thinking about is uh, this sort of bet the company type risk that comes from interrelated harm or interrelated lapses, compliance lapses. And so what I see is usually companies are focused on, you know, let's find, let's tamp down the small scale kind of easily identified known compliance violations out there. And the reason we do that is because we get the most credit for that from the Department of Justice and the guidance documents that we have. However, that I think creates a problem where there's almost a blind spot where because we're blanketing compliance everywhere, we are missing oftentimes this interrelated risk and the outsized risk that comes from uh, connected harm, if you will, or influence, socially influenced harm in organizations. And so, you know, uh, again, back to the Wells Fargo example, uh, you know, the company thought that they were doing a really good job by getting rid of, I mean, they fired 5,200 people. That's a lot of people. They did that pursuant to a compliance program. But what they were missing is how that harm moved through the organization and they could never really get their arms around it. And so that is, I think, the way that I'm thinking about an atypical harm, if you will. I have a question. Um, so my understanding of what, uh, like one of the implications of this research is that some entities, either individuals or uh, regulated entities might uh, merit, the most interconnected ones might merit uh, additional scrutiny. And I'm thinking about an implication of that, which is that in my experience, uh, environmental regulators are very concerned with being fair and with appearing to be fair. So I'm wondering if you can address uh, like the ethical implications uh, or is it fair to devote extra attention to very interconnected ones? And what do you, how would you explain that? Yeah, thanks Ben. I think it's a really interesting question. Um, as someone who's, you know, interested in business ethics professor, and someone's interested in the ethicality of not only what companies do, but how we, um, uh, we try to influence uh, companies to do the right thing. I think that's a really good one. Um, all right, so let me, let me try to take this, um, and I don't know if this is gonna be entirely satisfying, but within a company, um, I, think, I think the idea of more monitoring for either certain individuals, certain groups, certain levels of people, or certain ethical influencers, if you, if you will, is is completely justified. It's not necessarily, and I think that's ethically justified as well. It's not necessarily that 
you're going to restrict a particular employee because they fit some diagnostic. I think that could be problematic, you know, take away opportunities from them or, or something like that. But I think monitoring where your real risks are from a, from a conduct risk or an ethical standpoint, I think not only is ethical, I think it's appropriate. And I think it also meshes with a larger mission that companies have, which is uh, to create social welfare uh, more broadly and not, you know, uh, uh, hurt shareholders, customers, all kinds of stuff because you have some ethical lapse by, by an employee. So as long as you're upfront with em employees that that's what you're doing, I, I don't have, I don't see, um, I, I, can, I can see uh, potential problems, but I see uh, less concern than might otherwise have. Um, I guess from the regulator standpoint, um, you know, what the trend has been, at least from in the, on the criminal side, is to say, listen, uh, you know, you have to do, everybody has to do it all the same, right? So we're going to give this, I mean, the Department of Justice always says uh, there's no one size fits all, but they act a little bit differently because they only credit programs that do one size fits all. That's, that's how I see kind of the current landscape. What I would rather see is actually consistent with some of this new guidance, which says we want to see continuous improvement in organization. And so uh, it allows companies and organizations to kind of start where they are and then continually get better at their compliance processes. And so part of that to me is this notion of, hey, we're going to actually test and understand where our risks really are. And once we find those, we're going to monitor and we're going to, you know, um, increase our compliance tools targeted towards those risks. Once we do that, we hope we'll mitigate them. Then we're going to move on to the next most important risk and sort of go down the line. And so fairness is important so long as, uh, but I think you can, have, I guess you can have fairness without, um, without a uh, across the board uh, policy or without sort of staid compliance that falls into some of these common traps, I think, or, or, or some of the embedded assumptions uh, that we've been working on. So we also have a comment uh, from Harry Hunsaker. Uh, we are in the process of creating a reporting tool that completes that compiles compliance and enforcement data to identify what questions we should be asking ourselves to improve our effectiveness. This is an inward facing reporting tool. So I'm guessing that maybe you can give them some feedback on what questions you would think would be important to include in this internal uh, tool. Yeah, uh, that, that's great. Uh, and first of all, you know, I, I sort of applaud, uh, you know, any organization that's, that's doing that, that's proactively sort of taking those steps. So. Uh, that sounds to me like you're you're on the right track. Um, one set of questions that well, first of all, you know, I think about that as a as a risk dashboard, if you will, right? How do we look at data? How we use data in order to identify risks within our organization? Uh, and there's going to be lots of ones that are um, sort of out outward facing, but one bucket of that should be this idea of conduct risk that comes from our own employees with a recognition that it's not just like bad people, right? That all of us are able to do this under certain circumstances. So where are the risks? Um, so, so one thing, one set of questions, I think that you would wanna ask if you buy my, you know, buy my paper and buy my argument here is who is really influential in your organization, right? And so as part of your root cause analysis, as part of the risk, that are presented by whatever your organization is doing or whatever your company, whatever business you're engaged in, um, who is, who has ethical influence? And I think you can do that fairly, you know, you can start with the org chart, that's good, uh, but then you can also move pretty quickly to just understanding, right, some of these social connections within your organ own organization. And that sounds like a big ask on a, on a large scale uh, level, but if you break it down by, uh, you know, business units and stuff like that, I think it can, um, it, it's a lot more manageable. And then that just creates a, a set of questions or a set of ways to look at risk that I think is different than, than how people typically do it. Uh, 